Good morning, Wabash. Speaking today at Pioneer Chapel is Dr. Daniel Rogers with his talk titled, Conjugating Verbs in Paris. Dr. Rogers began his career at Wabash College in the last century before many of you were even born. After graduating from the University of Colorado, he completed his graduate studies in Spanish, Spanish literature at the University of Kansas, where he became a lifelong fan of Ed Ecuadorian literature and the Jayhawks. He has published extensively on Latin American literature and more recently, the connections between Asian and Latin American studies. A diehard Wabash sports fan, he looks forward to the baseball season and holding office hours in Goodrich Ballpark during home games. Please give a warm welcome for Dr. Rogers. Good morning, Wabash. Good morning. I love that part. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're surprised uh, to see me. I'm a little surprised to see you. Um, I had not been planning on giving a chapel talk today uh, until quite recently. Um, some of you may wonder why the title, Conjugating Verbs uh, in, in Paris. I think that's what the title is. Uh, I am also wondering why I chose that title, and you have to understand a little bit of the of the background. Um, I great career moment for me uh, last week. I was uh, invited uh, to give uh, a lecture at the University of Paris in, in in Paris, France. So I went. It was great. Yeah. No. Now the problem is uh, uh, jet lag. Jet lag is jet lag really is something. Maybe not when you're your age, but when you're my age, jet lag, jet lag just sucks. So I get home. I don't. When did I get home? I think I got home like Monday. N Whenever I got home that night, Jacob. Where's Jacob? Jacob Handley calls me, right? And Jacob doesn't normally call me. And so I, phone comes up, Jacob Handley. It was like 10 at night. Uh, and I'm oh my, I better answer this. Uh, one of our great Hispanic studies majors um, who, uh, who graduates this year. So I'm thinking, you know, better take this call. Um, and he says, oh, Dr. Rogers, um, you know, could you give chapel talk? Uh, and I said, Jacob, it gives me like a day. <laughs> uh, you know, and then he says, okay, great. Um, after I said yes, <laughs> kind of. He says, what's your title? I said, what, 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 what's my title? <laughs> I didn't know I was giving the talk until 10 seconds ago. So I'd just been in Paris. And, and there is, there is, there is, a, there is a reason for that. He also, you know, I wondered why he hadn't called Dr. Warner, you know, to fill in. Uh, Warner uh, brags that he's got five chapel talks already written, stuffed in an office drawer somewhere. Um, so I was tempted to break into his office and just find one, but um, I knew I'd probably just find banana nut muffins or something instead, so. <laughs> um, but it is, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to be, to be asked, yeah, even if it was uh, only, uh, less than 48 hours ago. Um, and it's intimidating. It's intimidating. When my students uh, this morning were asking me, are you nervous? And yeah, yeah. Um, a few weeks ago, right, we heard chapel talks uh, from Jonathan and Benjamin. Where are you guys? There you guys are. Uh, two unbelievably good chapel talks. Um, well thought out, well organized, uh, with, um, that, 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 that called uh, the student body and the faculty, the community to action. Um, and then, uh, it, was it just last week or the week be, I, I jet lag, um, the basketball seniors up here, right? Um, how do you stand up and give a chapel talk uh, 
after that. Uh, and remembering great chapel talks from over the years. I have uh, a, a few years of going to chapel talks, you know, since 1998, and there have been, there have been some great ones, including from uh, colleagues I, I see sitting out here who uh, I won't uh, name, uh, but uh, who I'm sure would love to be invited to, uh, to, to, to give a talk as well. Um, so back to the title, Conjugating Verbs in France. I was finished with the uh, with uh, this symposium that I'd attended and um, w was headed home. I arrive at Charles de Gaulle Airport uh, two and a half hours early, feeling like that's going to be plenty of time. You know, my age, you don't want to rush through the airport. I mean, you know, you want to take your time, be able to sit down, enjoy uh, enjoy the amenities. Uh, and so I, I get there and immediately there's a 90 minute line, an hour and a half line, just to go through passport control. And so I'm, you know, I'm nervous, um, uh, you know, the time's uh, counting down. I can see that they're going to board my aircraft. I then have to go through two security checks. I've got to present a COVID test. I've got to fill out extra paperwork. I get chosen for a random security check. Um, so I was nervous, I was nervous. And when I'm nervous, I conjugate verbs. If you're one of my 103 students, you know this. And you know the story that I'm about to tell. It's a story of Dr. Blix and I in Mexico 20 years ago. Uh, Dr. Blix and several other Wabash faculty traveled to Mexico uh, on, uh, for a, 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 we were putting together a, 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 a part of a course on Latin America at the time. And we, it, we, it was an amazing experience. We got Dr. Blix up to the top of the Piramide del Sol, uh, which is quite a hike. And then we got him down. <laughs> and that was really the adventure. Uh, we got him down. Uh, we spent this wonderful week together as faculty, thinking about the curriculum, thinking about, uh, thinking about Latin America. We get to the airport in Mexico City uh, to come home, and we find out that our flight has been canceled. Not just that the airplane has been canceled, but the, the route, the airline has eliminated that route. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm a new professor at that time, but I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that speaks Spanish. So uh, I, I go to, to take care of the situation and figure out how we're all gonna get home. And it, it all worked out. But I left Dr. Blix and some other faculty at a little cafe in the, in the airport. Uh, one of those places that has like uh, paper menus. And, and when I got back, I saw that Blix had turned his, his menu over and there were just columns of Greek verbs conjugated. Like something out of a weird movie or something, right? <laughs> um, and I said, D I didn't call him David back then. Uh, uh, Dr. Blix, what are you doing? And he explained that he was conjugating verbs in Greek, which is something that he always did to calm his nerves in times of stress. And so that's something, uh, that's a, a habit I've adopted and something that I've um, uh, advised my students to do ever since. Uh, when you're feeling nervous, uh, conjugate verbs. Why, which brings up a good question, why do we learn to conjugate verbs? Why do we learn new languages? Conjugating verbs adds information to them. Uh, verbs, uh, at least in Romance languages, start off in the infinitive. And if you think about that, we don't normally think about what that means, right? what that name means. The infinitive, they can, they can represent a kind of infinite number of possibilities. And we conjugate them, and, 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 and we kind of tie them down a little bit. And we say, this is who did it, and this is when it happened. And we add other information that my Spanish 103 students better be able to explain tomorrow on their quiz um, about what happens to the verb when we conjugate it. Um, this, uh, for my uh, uh, 
uh, my philosophy colleagues, uh, in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein, an exceptionally influential 20th century philosopher, famously wrote that the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. And to be fair, and I, I have to be fair because people who know a lot more about Wittgenstein than I do uh, may hear this. Wittgenstein was talking about language uh, in a much more general philosophical sense. He was a systematic philosopher. But we can take his point, I think, to help us understand why learning languages is so important. It provides us with a map of culture. Language is foundational to identity. One of the conventional things we hear people say about learning a new language is that it opens up new vistas. It enables us to understand the world from new points of view. If we're not careful, we can get a little dangerously close to cliche with those kinds of expressions. But I think there's an important nugget of truth there. We know ourselves and we know others through language. We orient ourselves in the world through language. One of the greatest things that learning a different language and all those verb conjugations, uh, one of the things that that's done for me personally is to open up the pages of extraordinary writers and poets who would otherwise be closed to me. Don't misunderstand, translation is important and you can, you can take great courses in, in, in other departments here with world literature and translation. Um, but, oh, and I also should add, I occasionally have the opportunity to teach a course uh, on translation that is, it, it's, one of the, it's one of the most enjoyable courses I get to teach. And I've team taught it a couple of times with uh, Dr. Annie Fisher, who is, uh, is a world-renowned translator. She is exceptional. Um, but the problem is, a vanishingly small fraction of all of the important things ever written get translated. Come by my office and you will see bookshelves full of books, um, a lot of it Ecuadorian literature, and almost none of it translated. Almost none of it available to anyone who doesn't already speak Spanish. So why does it feel like, what does it feel like to have a new linguistic world opened up to you when you learn another language. In some sense, it's something that you have to do in order, you have to experience to understand. But, uh, but I'd like to try at least to give you a sense by reading and talking about uh, one of the poems I discussed last week at the University of Paris. Because um, gentlemen, I had less than 48 hours to prepare this talk. So you're gonna hear a little bit about, uh, about what I've been thinking about uh, recently. Um, I picked a very short one, so don't worry, but I'm going to read it first in Spanish and then rather than give you a word-for-word -word translation, kind of give you a gloss. It comes from a collection of poetry by one of Ecuador's most important living writers, Jorge Davila Vázquez, um, and it's uh, entitled Ciego en la Noche. Ciego en la Noche tropiezas en uh, una vez y otra en el jardín plantado por tus manos, un mundo extraño te rodea, inédito. Solo te orientan los intensos perfumes, jacarandá, cedrón, jazmín, o el aroma pungente de la ruda. So, the, the, the poet, the voice in the poem tells us um, blind at night, and it, it, it's, addressing, it's addressing somebody in the, second, in the second person. He says, you, you, you bump around, stumble around in a garden that you yourself planted. And a strange foreign world surrounds you, uh, unpublished, unread. The only thing that orients you, that gives you a sense of direction, are the intense smells, perfumes, of jacaranda, cedron, jasmine, and rue. Well, that's, that, that's, a, that's an interesting, that's a cure for me, that's a really interesting poem, because it starts off with things that are pretty easy to, to kind of, kind of enter, right? Okay, I can, well, yeah. let's put that there. 
I sometimes talk with my hands. Um, students can attest to that. A garden, interesting garden. I planted the garden maybe with my own hands. It's something in my own construction. I, yeah, I'm surrounded by an unread, unpublished world. And then these very specific mentions of, uh, of plants. And now I'm worried because uh, a real botanist is actually here. So um, <laughs> bear with me. Um, so the, the first two that he mentions have a really strong resonance uh, for Ecuador. The first two, uh, jacaranda and cedron. So the jacaranda tree, the jacaranda mimosfolio, is a flowering tree and in the mountains of Ecuador, in the valleys of the mountains of Ecuador, in Quito and especially in Cuenca, there are tons of them. And the poet is from Cuenca. So here, here's the poet talking about these flowering trees that would be very familiar, familiar to anybody in, um, in, 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 that, um, in that environment. Um, and the, the etymology, jacaranda, that comes from the Tupi Guarani language, an indigenous Latin American language. So, so again, what's orienting, what's orienting us in the poem? Something that's deeply, deeply uh, Latin American. And then cedron, um, which in English I believe is called lemon uh, verbena. It's also uh, in Spanish, it's more commonly known as yerba luisa. And if you have a stomach ache in Ecuador, this is what people are going to make for you a tea made out of yerba luisa. And it works, it works. It's, it's an herbal tea that is, uh, that's been used for, for who knows how long. Now, the last plant that's mentioned is really curious. Ruda, or rue. Um, and it's interesting because it has a really deep kind of meta, metafictional resonance. Rue, have you, have you ever heard of I really, not until I dove into this, knew much about rue. Rue is the plant that Ophelia, who is the daughter of Polonius in the play Hamlet. Uh, Ophelia, in, at, toward the end of the play, she's, she's maddened, she's um, disoriented. Uh, she begins to speak through this language of plants. Uh, as, as, as symbols. She says, um, she says in this really, it's a, kind of a creepy scene. Uh, she says, there's a fennel for you and columbines. She's kind of running around everybody on the stage and columbines. And then she goes up to Gertrude, who may be one of the great villains in the play, right? And she says, ah, and here's rue for you. You, she points to Gertrude, says, you must wear your rue with a difference. In English, rue, and so I, I, I looked up the Latin, it's ruta uh, gravelians. Rue, uh, also known as uh, herb of grace, is related to the English verb to rue. Do you know this verb, to rue, to regret? He rued something that had happened. It's kind of an archaic verb, but you'll still hear it from time to time. It's related to that. It was also used to sprinkle holy water. It's got lots of interesting things going on. Even more interestingly, rue was used anciently as a treatment for the darkening of the eyes, for blindness. Remember the first line of the poem. In Milton's Paradise Lost, the archangel Michael uses rue to heal Adam's eyes. So, a very short quotation from one of my, uh, one of my favorite poems. Um, Michael, from Adam's eyes, the film removed, which that false fruit that promises clearer sight had bred, then purged with euphrasy and rue, the visual nerve, for he had much to see, and from the well of life three drops instilled, so deep the power of these ingredients pierced even to the inmost seat of mental sight the Adam now forced to close his eyes sunk down and all his spirits from him became in transit 
but him the gentle angel by the hand soon raised, and his attention, and of course sight, thus recalled. Adam, in the poem, miserable, rueful, regretful, wanders blind, ciego, tropiezas, Adam. Uh, tropezar means to, 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 to bump around, and here it's in the second person informal simple present indicative. Right? No, conjugations are important. Conjugations are important. Adam stumbles about the Garden of Eden, the first forbidden garden, and the angel washes his eyes, restoring his visual nerve. Also ironic, because Milton became blind himself, the, the, the poet who wrote it. So there you go. From conjugating verbs in the Paris airport to the deep intertextual connections between an Ecuadorian poem and Shakespeare and John Milton. Now normally, at this point in a chapel talk, that is to say the conclusion, I'd give you some rousing words, some great Wabash memory. You'd rise to your feet, thundering ovation. <laughs> but I recognize that that's hard uh, to do these days. Have you watched the news? Things seem cloudy and uncertain and dangerous. There are wars and rumors of wars. Politics are toxic. For my own mental health and yours, I'm not gonna keep going down the list. You know what I'm talking about. So let me end with two things. First, something that I've learned from reading poetry like what I've read to you this morning, and that's that reading poetry is one of the things that helps. Struggling with new verbs and puzzling through difficult ideas helps me get outside of my own head. At the same time, that it helps me think and feel more deeply. Don't laugh before you try it. Read some poetry. And if you're one of my students, you know my other recommendation is to also listen to some opera. Don't laugh until you've tried it. Connecting with extraordinary poets and writers whose life experience and language are different from our own helps us to live in a bigger, richer, more meaningful world. And if you want suggestions about what to read, please talk to any member of my department. Second, reading things like Ciego Tropiezas is a choice. Picking up a book, opening it up is a choice. Learning to live in a difficult world is a choice. It reminds me of an idea that I first heard about from Wabash's pre-health advisor. <laughs> Um, who introduced me and many of you to the life and work of Dr. Paul Farmer, whose recent and untimely death is still on our minds. Um, maybe uh, someone should ask her sometime to, oh, she's shaking her head. Um, I don't know, it could be a great chapel talk. So, and with Paul Farmer, uh, in a film that some of you may know, Bending the Ark, uh, she loves to remind me of the thinking of Dr. Jim Young Kim, an American physician and anthropologist who served as president of the World Bank and who is, like Paul Farmer was, deeply committed to addressing inequities in healthcare and in other facets of life. Dr. Young said, quote, optimism is not a rational analysis. Optimism is a moral choice. I sometimes find optimism, and I find pessimism, and sometimes many, many other things in the poetry of Davi Lavasquez and Shakespeare and Milton. And I'm not gonna try to naively tell you that conjugating verbs and reading poetry will fix what's wrong with the world, but it will make your world bigger, and that helps. Thank you, Wabash.